Years ago, I was preaching through the book of Ephesians, and I noticed something that seemed to be missing. I was reading through the part about the armor of God, and uh, at the time I was studying Roman history extensively, and, and Roman history is a long run. That's from the first king of Rome, Romulus, in 753 BC, and the history of Rome runs until 476 AD, when another Romulus was defeated by Odiesser, a barbarian invading from the north. And the consistent theme across these centuries after centuries, about a millennia, 753 BC to 476 AD, a consistent theme is the strength of the Roman legions. And so when Paul is talking about the, the armor of God, he's using the, the well-known uh, equipment that the Roman legionary wore, talking about how our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, against the spiritual forces of evil, and so to respond by putting on the armor of God, which consists of the, the belt uh, of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of whatever will take you where you need to go to proclaim the gospel of of peace, the shield of faith to quench the flaming arrows, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. This is the equipment of a Roman soldier, and uh, everyone at that time would have known it just as well as if someone walks in the door right now uh, and wearing green camo and holding an M16, we, we know uh, something about them. We, we know what they're doing. They're, they're a soldier, right? Now, the way the Roman legions fought was they fought in what's called a phalanx. And so what would happen was um, you would have, you would be armed, you, you would have all, be wearing all the gear, and, and then to your, you'd have your, your shield and, and breastplate and, and helmet. And then to your left would be another person with a shield, and so it would overlap with your shield, and another person, and another person, and another person. And you would have a line as wide as you could make it of people with overlapping shields. So uh, you were protecting the brother to your left and to your right. And then there would be line after line deep as well. And so there would be 5, 10, 15, 20 people deep behind you, all marching forward, all with shields, all with helmets, all with the breastplates, and then with the offensive weapon of the phalanx, which was the spear. The spear, which was a 12 to 16 foot long uh, weapon, and so you would have the spear counterbalanced on the end so you could hold it straight, and then the guy behind you, like right behind you, would also have a spear pointing over your shoulder. And so that every, if someone was approaching the phalanx, they wouldn't just have to get by the first row of spear points. They'd have to get every foot, two foot, there'd be another spear point trying to kill them. And so, and then as you get further back, as people, 10 people back couldn't point their spear all the way forward, they would sort of angle it up, and all those spears angled up was actually a very effective defense against incoming arrows. The arrows would hit on the, the halves of the spears and just fall to the ground, and it might poke you, but it wouldn't kill you. So this is just a very effective tool, a very effective formation. If you were in front of, of a phalanx, you, you were looking at something that would probably kill you because it was just marching forward and it would just be a wall of spear points and shields. And so if you look at what Paul is describing as the armor of God, he talks about the, the breastplate and the shield and, and, and the, the helmet and the belt and the shoes, but he doesn't say anything about the spear. Right? You notice the spear is missing. The, the, she, the, the sword is there, right? But the sword in a phalanx, when you're fighting and you want to keep your enemy 12 to 16 foot in front of you, the point at which you pull your sword, it, everything has fallen apart. 
Like the, the sword was just not what you wanted to be using because you wanted the phalanx everyone to be holding in formation. The sword was a purely defensive last ditch weapon in phalanx combat. It would be compared to like having pepper spray today. Like you, at the point at which you're using pepper spray, something has gone horribly wrong. Like that, that's bad. It's a bad situation. And so as I was reading through the armor of God, knowing what I know about how the Roman legion fought using this phalanx, seeing how the spear wasn't there, I started thinking and making these, these connections about uh, how the prophet Isaiah says that as God comes to judge that the reactions will be that swords will be beat into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, and nations will go to war no more. And a phalanx without spears cannot really go to war, right? That's not what the, it can do. It can march forward, but it can't go to war. Further, the prophet Isaiah talks about the coming Prince of Peace, and the prin a Prince of Peace could lead a phalanx that does not have spears. Talking about, um, I started thinking about how Jesus takes the sword away from one of his disciples who cuts the ear off someone who, uh, well, uh, takes the sword away from one of his disciples who pulls the sword to defend him when Jesus is arrested. And so this seems to be in line with that, that Paul is making this point about how the church works together. You lean on your, your family to your left and your right. You know that you have a bunch of people who have your back. You're marching forward uh, together towards a common goal. And here we're going to do this, but we're not going to use spears as we do it. Right? That sounds like it would be a great, I, mean, I think it would be an interesting and fun sermon. Right? I, I had shared this idea with some youth a few years ago, and I thought about that, and um, maybe it'd be fun on a Sunday, get a bunch of people to come forward, and we can build a little phalanx and see what happens. The youth loved playing with long, pointy objects, and well, we'll see, maybe we'll try it. I was in the middle of putting this sermon together, something I've been chewing on and just had in my back pocket for a long time, for three or four years now, and uh, I was doing some more research. I wanted to understand a little bit more about what's going on, and I found out something that blew it all apart on me. You see, Europe isn't flat. You may have noticed this if you've ever traveled in Europe, but Europe is not flat. And Rome is in Italy, and if you go very far beyond Rome, uh, you're going to start getting into some hills, and maybe even some mountains if you go to the north. And what happened to the Romans as they used a phalanx in the first couple centuries is that by the third century BC, so this is 300 years before Jesus and 350, 360 years before Paul would have been writing this, what happened was the Roman legions changed how they fought. Instead of having a phalanx, which is 15 people stacked, all, all really close and tight to each other, all facing forward, all going in the same direction, they had to change what they were doing. They put down the long spears, and they, used it. They, and they went to using swords because they realized that if you have 15 to 20 people deep, and you have a flat ground and you can just march forward, that works out well. But if you have to go down a hill, that doesn't work. Or if you have to go up a hill, or if someone gets behind you, you're, you can't turn if you're holding a 12-foot spear pointed forward. It's not like you can just like turn. So what had happened in the 3rd century BC is they'd given up on the phalanx and they'd gone to a new system called the maniple system in which they had one line of soldiers, and then five to 10 feet behind, they had another line of soldiers, and then 10 foot behind that, they had another line of soldiers. And so that, if necessary, when they're engaging the enemy to their front, they could stack up if needed. They always had those guys who could run forward as reinforcements, or if someone came at them from the rear, one of that second or third line could turn and go deal with another problem. And so they had flexibility. And if they could go down a hill, like a phalanx could not go down a hill. If you have five, 10 feet between you and the next guy, well, you have enough room to go down a hill without falling all over each other. And so they had put down the spear and the tool that they used, the offensive tool, 
of the Roman legions from the 3rd century BC going onwards into the time of Jesus and Paul was the sword. Right? This is what Paul would have known. This is what all the people reading Paul's letter would have known. And my very satisfying, amusing, interesting, or at least satisfying to me, sermon, looking at what Paul was getting at about the nature of the church, had an unfortunate run-in with the facts. That the, the facts being that the entire formation of, of, that the Romans used was based around using swords. So, hug. I stand by my understanding that Jesus is the Prince of Peace who brings together all of creation, working towards reconciliation, and that is a whole that leads to the whole discussion about uh, nonviolence and just war, and that's worth engaging. Different sermons, but that's not what Paul is talking about in Ephesians. But right? and I considered starting from scratch because I still had half the week to go. I could have started from scratch. I. I and you would never known about this. Like that. And I would have been able to write a new sermon and, and really got at something uh, more biblically true, something more rooted in facts, because as we have just understood, my, my sermon was great until it encountered history, and then it fell apart. But I think there's a, a value not just in understanding uh, what the Bible says, but also the process by which we go about reading the Bible and reading it well, I think that process is worth looking at. I, Because reading the, the scriptures, we, we need to be able to say at times, I thought I was reading scripture well, and I did, and I was wrong. I've said it before that I reserve the right to be wrong, and I exercised that this week as I was writing this. And that this, this is going to happen. It happens to me. It happens to all of us. Because the temptation as we read scripture is either to figure out what the Bible says and, and think we figured it out once and then never question it again. Like, I, I figured it out. Like, I figured out this is what Paul is saying in his letter to the church at Ephesus, and I don't need to think about it again because I already have it figured out. Right? That's one temptation. Right. The other temptation is to just go to scripture with what we already think and find the ways that we can force scripture to back up what we already think i think that this is how i should this is what the bible should say and oh there's a passage that seems line up with what i think it should say and that's the other temptation of reading scripture and to avoid either temptation is really important because when it comes to reading scripture, how we read it matters. For example, we are part of a church that has a certain way of reading scripture. The Methodist Church. And the Methodist Church ordains women based upon a reading of scripture that I fully support. Paul says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus. And so all who are called are equal, equally able to serve in the church. Male or female doesn't matter. If you are called by God to serve, you can be a preacher in the Methodist denomination. There are other churches that read scripture differently and do, that do not ordain women. And I think that's not as good of a way to read scripture. I think it misses the centrality that, yes, Paul does talk about how in that particular church, women should not have authority over men. And maybe there is something going on in that church that that, that particular women, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that Paul says, in Christ, a universal statement, a universal claim, in Christ there is neither male nor female. And I think that should guide how we, we live. And that is the Methodist way to read Scripture. So how we read scripture, it will matter for how we, how we understand who can do what in the church. What should we do as people who follow Jesus? But we cannot pretend that reading the Bible is as simple as opening it, reading once, and, and calling it done. There, there's a bumper sticker that I see on occasion. The Bible, the Bible, God wrote it, the Bible says it, that settles it. Like this idea that you just read the Bible once and then you're done and that's it, right? It's, I wish it could be that simple. 
But Jesus himself acknowledges that there is always more to learn. In John 14, he talks about how he will send the Holy Spirit, the advocate who will lead us into all truth, which implies fairly squarely that there is always something more to learn, that we're never done reading the Bible. Like, this is part of why I always find it amusing to see the Bible in the library, like, because what you, what you do with the library book is you check it out, you read it, and then you turn it back in. And it's the idea of like, I'm going to turn the Bible in, I'm done reading it. No, you're not. You're never done reading it. As a follower of Jesus, we are never done reading the Bible. There's always more to explore and, and to contemplate and to ponder. We read in Acts that the very first argument about the, in the church, like the first time they had a board meeting where everyone got nervous, like what's, what's, how this is going to turn out, like we have what happened in Acts 15. And, and what it was about was how do we read scripture? No one was showing up and saying we should or shouldn't read scripture. What they were doing, some people were showing up and saying we read scripture to say that uh, if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to follow all the Jewish laws. And other people are showing up saying, if we, well, the way we read scripture is if you're going to follow Jesus, like hit the basics. Don't, don't commit idolatry, some basics. But, but you don't have to become Jewish to be able to follow Jesus. It is the first questions of the church are, how do we read the Bible together? How do we read the Bible together in a faithful, consistent, and workable fashion that helps us follow Jesus? To put this as concisely as I can, to read the Bible is to listen to God's word. Right? That, that's the goal. To read the Bible is to listen to God's word. And if I bring my assumptions to it, thinking that I already know what it says, what is there then I'm not listening to God's word. Like if I go to the Bible and I open it up, just convinced that I already know what I'm going to be reading, that I already have it figured out, that I already understand everything I need to understand, then I'm not listening to God's word. What I'm listening to is myself. And the word of Andy is not what's going to save me or anyone. It is the word of God that brings salvation and forgiveness, reconciliation and hope. I don't open the Bible to read what I already know, what I already think. I re open the Bible to read what is God's word to us who are trying to live today. And, and so as a reminder to myself publicly, and, and a reminder to all of us as people who read scripture together, I would like to remind us that the best way to read scripture is together. We bring, when we bring everything we have to bring, to bring our intellect, the traditions of the church, respecting the knowledge of others, to, to read scripture together is essential. And, and the best person to read scripture with is a farmer. Because this Bible is written in an agricultural society, and in large part, we are not an agricultural society anymore. And so, so to read the Bible with its parables of wheat and grain and land, the people who understand that best are farmers, and we need to listen to them. Right? To read Scripture well is to read it together, and to acknowledge that we might be wrong in how we read it. The word of God is described as a sword when, when uh, Paul is talking about the armor of God, the sword, which is the word of the Lord. And, and it also shows up in Revelation again that the, the, the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth, the word of God, is double-edged. If you look at what it is, it's a double-edged sword. It can cut both ways. To read scripture, it, I could cut myself on it. Right? it. It could challenge me. It challenges the world, but it also challenges me that I might be wrong. So we read together, we read with a sense of humility that we might be wrong. And finally, we read in a way that begins and ends with prayer. For in prayer, we are starting by turning to God and listening to God and to say that we aren't doing this just for ourselves. We're doing this to seek God's words, to know that this is what Jesus desires. And so I think that's how we need to end today is to end in prayer. And so I invite you to bow your heads and let us pray together. Lord, bless we who receive the gift of your word of the Bible. Direct us towards it again and again and again as containing the words that we need. The words of forgiveness, of hope, and guidance. And keep us humble, listening to you and to each other, always aware that there's always so much more to learn. Amen.